Welcome, statistics scholars. We are now going to do our next discussion, which is on measurements. Uh, or essentially, I want to give you just a basic primer on the challenge of psychological data. And this is the idea that in any kind of measurement that has to do with people, or we're trying to figure out what's true about people, there is a challenge to it because there is no ruler for your mind. Essentially, I can't go to Home Depot and I can't buy a tape measure for love. I can't buy a yardstick for aggression. There is no scale that will measure your depression. So whenever you're trying to assess people's psychological realities, you have a problem on your hands because you can't measure them physically. You can't measure them directly. And so there's an entire branch of psychology called quantitative psychology, of which um, part of my PhD training was dedicated to that, and a sub-branch of quantitative psychology called psychometrics, which is all about measurement. How do we measure love? How do we measure aggression? How do we measure anxiety? You can't touch it. You can't smell it. But it's real. Love is real. Anxiety is real. Depression is real. But how do you measure it? If you want to ask a really cool research question, like, is age related to cognitive functioning? How are you going to measure it? That becomes the question. So then the question really becomes, how can we measure the unobservable? How can we measure love without a tape measure for love? Well, this brings up a new vocab word that you need to know, or two vocab words put together. And it's this idea of a psychological construct. Anything that you can't measure physically, psychologists call a psychological construct, where you will have to observe them indirectly. So we observe the unobservable by observing them indirectly, right? And so if you think about it, anything that's going to be considered psychological is a construct. Now, why do we call it this? Why do we call it a psychological construct? Well, we call it a psychological construct because we have to construct our definitions of what we mean by love. What do you mean by aggression? You're going to have to construct your definition. Essentially, what you say is, well, since I can't measure it directly, I can't whip out a ruler and shove it into your brain to measure how much aggression or depression or anxiety or whatever is psychological, because I can't measure it directly, I'm going to have to define very specifically. I'm going to have to construct what I mean when I say aggression. I'm going to have to decide what are the observable behaviors, the observable things I'm going to use to indirectly define those unobservable psychological characteristics. So here's basically how it works. Once you know you have a psychological construct like let's say depression. You have, to you have to construct your definition of it and so that it becomes a psychological construct, let's say depression. You have to come up with what's called an operational definition where you say, what in the world that I can actually physically observe am I going to use to define depression? What behavior am I going to use to define depression? And that becomes your operational definition. It's called that because just like you operate a car to make it work, you have to operate your definition so that it will work. You have to decide what are the actual human behaviors that I can observe that I'm going to use to define depression, right? And so you're going to be measuring depression indirectly through the things that you can observe directly. And those things that you can observe directly are called operational definitions. So let's go through some examples of psychological constructs, psychological phenomenon that have to be operationally defined in order for you to measure them, um, in order for you to figure out how you're going to wrap your head 
around doing research about them. Because that's why this matters. If you're going to do research on a particular topic, like let's say you want to study depression, you have to measure depression, which means you're going to have to operationally define depression because there's no scale, there's no like bathroom scale for depression, right? That's the idea. So here are three psychological constructs, aggression, life satisfaction, and depression. And here are three pretty poor, I mean not very good, operational definitions. So let's say aggression. I'm going to define it as the number of times on the playground I see a child yell, hit, or kick someone else. That's one way that I could define aggression as a researcher. And that was that is something I can observe. Now, yelling isn't always aggressive, right? And so yelling and kicking and hitting aren't the same thing as aggression. They're just the observable behaviors that I'm going to identify and use to indirectly get at this idea of this wibbly wobbly psychological thing that I'm going to call aggression. Life satisfaction. I might give you a scale and I say on a scale of 1 to 10, tell me how satisfied you are with your life. With 1 being not at all satisfied and 10 being very satisfied. Right? That's one observable thing I could use to sort of get at your life satisfaction. Now, do you think a single item like that is going to encapsulate every single aspect of someone's life satisfaction? Probably not. But it's one way I could go about doing it. Or let's say depression. Maybe I'm only going to say that someone has any depression at all if they have a... Uh, if they have a um, diagnosis from a clini clinician, from a doctor or a therapist. Again, a pretty poor operational definition, but I could do that. I could decide that. But you see how challenging it becomes. So you try. You come up with some psychological construct like anxiety or love, and you figure out how are you going to define it. How are you going to define it in such a way that you could give someone a score? Because that's the idea. You want to be able to measure something in such a way to get a score for them, right? Because if I'm counting up the number of times a child yells or I'm counting up the number of times a child hits another kid or kicks another kid, at the end of the day, I'm going to get a, a score for that child where higher numbers will mean more aggression than lower numbers. If I give you a self-report where I say on a scale of 1 to 10, how life satisfied are you? Higher numbers are going to indicate more life satisfaction than lower numbers will. And each person will get a number for their life satisfaction. And that is the goal of psychological measurement. And people spend a lifetime, a whole, a whole careers, figuring out how to measure people well. Um, if you've ever taken a standardized test, there is quantitative psychologists who sat down to figure out how are we going to measure people on these psychological characteristics of academic success, academic achievement, academic potential? Every, every test you have ever taken, in every class you have ever taken, has been an exercise in psychological measurement. Your teacher gave you an exam that was supposed to measure your understanding of the material. Well, that sounds pretty psychological to me. And hopefully you had a good instructor who knew how to craft a test that measured just that. If you were unlucky and did not have an instructor who measured things well, well, maybe your test did not actually reflect your uh, class, um, your understanding of the material. But that's the challenge, the challenge of psychological measurement. The challenge of measuring anything about a person that isn't physical is figuring out how you're going to operationally define it. How are you going to give someone a number for this psychological construct? So to refresh your memory, we've already talked about measurement a little bit. When I taught you the distinction between qualitative and quantitative variables, which remember variables are questions that we ask people. They're ways that people can be different, like what is your hair color or how many cups of coffee did you have today? Those variables, the questions we can ask people on which people will be different, will generate data. And so that just as there are qualitative and quantitative variables, those generate qualitative and quantitative data. Well, then you can really think about it as there is really qualitative measurement that where you ask people qualitative questions about qualitative variables where the people give you qualitative data like what color is your hair, what kind of car do you drive, um, do you own a cat or not, 
right? These either or, are you in this camp or not type of questions. Versus quantitative measurement, where you ask people quantitative questions about quantitative variables, where they will give you quantitative data, such as how many children do you have? How many cups of coffee have you had today? How many times a week do you work out? On a scale of one to seven, how much do you love the um, Mighty Ducks of Anaheim? And I would say seven because the ducks are awesome, right? That's the idea. The idea is there's qualitative measurement and qualitative measurement. Qualitative measurement and quantitative measurement. And it's not a new definition. It's exactly like we talked about before. But keep in mind that when you think about it this way, it's the recognition that if you want to do research on people, you have to get a number for them on any variable. Now, if it's a qualitative variable, like let's say gender, because gender is almost always measured qualitatively, where we're saying pick a camp. Are you, are you uh, a man or a woman or in some capacity, neither of these categories. We don't allow people to exist on a dimension of, and I don't mean like a law, I mean like in research, we typically don't say, okay, we've got maleness over here and females, oh, femaleness over here. Are you over here, over here, or somewhere in the middle? We don't generally allow people to answer the question in this fashion. Right? Um, it's usually, are you male or are you female? And if it's a very inclusive survey, you might have an, a, a decline to state button or a, a box or a other box or some sort of thing that says none of these other two things. Right? But it's a categorical variable. It's a qualitative variable. Therefore, you're engaged in qualitative measurement. Well, you're going to give people numbers. You might label um, women as one and men as zeros. You might uh, label uh, men as one and women as negative ones. You could label men as one and women as two, right? If you're being a very inclusive, you might have men as one, women as two, and uh, a sort of not decline to state or other category as three, or you could flip it around. You could have decline to state as one and women as two and male as, as three, right? But the numbers are simply placeholders. They're placeholders for the names, for the words that are the real answers to the question. But in quantitative measurement, when you generate a number for somebody using your operational definitions, those numbers indicate amount. Right, where if I if I'm measuring um, how fast someone can run a mile, and I, and I and I'm timing them with a stopwatch, my operational definition would then be the time on the stopwatch, how fast it took them. Right, and when somebody has a five and a half, and somebody else has a six point three, and somebody else like me has twenty minutes and thirty and and thirty seconds, that number is my. And that number on the stopwatch was the operational definition for their mile times. And then each person is going to have a number for their mile time, which is quantitative measurement. I have asked a question about a quantitative variable. How fast can you run a mile? I was engaged in quantitative measurement where I generated some quantitative data about those people in my study. So, but what makes for good measurement then? That becomes the question, right? Because I, I, I pointed out to you in those previous slides that the operational definitions I came up with for um, aggression, life satisfaction, and depression were actually pretty poor. Those are pretty poor operational definitions. And so the question then becomes, the good question is how good are our operational definitions? If you're going to be a researcher and if you're going to study depression, and let's say you're going to say that there is a genetic link to depression, you would better be pretty darn sure. You would be pretty darn sure that how you have defined depression is actually depression, right? So you have to ask yourself as a researcher, or if you're the person reading, reading about research that they've done on depression, if you're the consumer of that research, you have to ask yourself this question, how good were these individuals' operational definitions? Because there's not a statistic in the world that can save you from bad measurement. If you don't have a good definition for what you mean by a psychological characteristic, you can't do research on it. And no statistic in the world can help you. You have to decide what you mean by the constructs you're hoping to study. If you want to study aggression, you should know what you mean by aggression. Have excellent operational definitions.
So then that really does beg the question. That the question then becomes, what makes for good measurement? What makes for a good operational definition? And the answer is two things, reliability and validity. And you have to check your everyday understanding of these two words at the door. Because you've probably heard these two words before. You've probably heard the word reliable, like a car is reliable, or my dog is reliable, or you know, a person you might date is a very reliable person, a backhanded compliment if I've ever heard one, right? You've probably even heard the word validity before, like that's not a valid argument, or there's no validity to his claims. And although those everyday usages of these two words, reliability and validity, are related, we're going to use these two words in a very specific context. We're going to use them in a very specific definition, and they mean two very different things when we apply them to measurement and we apply them to statistical analysis. Reliability means one thing, and validity means a whole other thing. And so, it is, but it is, it is these two characteristics that make for good measurement, makes for good tests, makes for good surveys, good indices, right? These are all just synonyms for the same idea. But you're going to try to measure someone. You're going to try to figure out what's going on in their head. And if your measurement is reliable and valid, then you've got yourself a fantastic operational definition, and you can go forth and do research, right? So first of all, what is reliability? Well, reliability is about consistency. And really, it's about the idea that if you measure something in a reliable fashion, if your test or your survey or your, or, or your um, clinician's report about a person, if it's reliable, if you gave the person the test again, they should get the same score. That's the idea, that your operational definition, your test or your survey or your however you choose to define your construct, which again is a psychological characteristic, if you did the same thing again, you would get the same result because you're measuring something real about the person. That's the idea about reliability. It's the fact that you've actually tapped in to real things about the person and not random noise. And you're like, random noise? Well, yeah. There are some tests that are really bad. The questions are confusing. The questions use awkward language. They use words that you're not at all familiar with. And so when you answer the question, you're not even really answering it about anything about you. You may just be like randomly guessing. And so if you took the test again, you may get a very different score because it's not a reliable test because it's not measuring anything real about you. And there's a variety of things that can make a test unreliable, right? Um, but if it's measuring real things about you, every time you took the test, every time you get measured by this instrument, every time you get measured by this survey or this question or this clinician, every time you get tested for whatever psychological characteristic you're trying to test, right? Depression, anxiety, your knowledge in a class, if it's a reliable test, you should get the same result again. That is the idea. It is about consistency. And there's two ways that we can estimate how reliable a test or survey is or any psychological measurement. We can look to see if within a particular measurement, all the different subparts of your operational definition are telling the same story. For example, in my, in my example about uh, I'm going to measure kids' aggression by their yells, kicks, and hits, I would say that I might have evidence of reliability if, if I think all of those behaviors are all being caused by the same thing. Well, I should see that there's some consistency, that if a kids high in yelling are also high in kicking, and kids high in kicking are also high in hitting. Right? And kids low in one behavior, low in them all. So within my one operational definition, I'm getting the same pattern for all of the different behaviors. Well, let me give you another example. Let's say on uh, an upcoming exam, I have six items that are all supposed to measure your understanding of central tendency. And you don't know what that is yet, but whatever. The, all six items are supposed, supposed to measure the same real thing about you. And... If every single time I ask you a question, 
you're showing, giving you the same kind of answer? Well, then all six of those items are measuring something real about you. Well, let me give you yet another example. So if you have ever taken like an online survey that said, what Harry Potter house would you be in? If you were an animal, what kind of animal would you be? We would say that, that the operational definition was consistent within itself if all of the items that were supposed to measure your animalness, if you were answering high on those items, some of the items, you were answering high on them all. Another uh, of your answers low on some of the items, you were answering low on them all. Or let's say you're taking a Harry Potter quiz. If there was an item about Ravenclaw, and there were like six different items that were sort of assessing how Ravenclaw-ish you are, you would definitely be answering either high or low, depending on your predilection, depending on whether or not you sort of identify with Ravenclaw, the house from Harry Potter. If you don't like Harry Potter and you've never watched or read Harry Potter, I'm very sorry that that, that metaphor is lost on you, or that example, rather. Um, so that's the idea. A second way of measuring or thinking about reliability is to actually just give the person the same test again. Like if I give you a 15 item measurement, a 15 item survey, and every, all 15 items are supposed to measure depression, and I'm going to give you a score based on how many of the items you say, yes, I feel this way, right? If I want to establish its reliability, I might just give you the test again in a month. Because I it is because if you really have major depression, your depression shouldn't like wildly change across time. Or at least if I'm measuring something real about you, something real and stable, whether it's depression or not. But if, if I'm at least measuring something reliable, anything reliable about you, if I give you the test today and then I give you that same test in a month, you should give me the ge generally the same answer. If you don't, then. I'm measuring random stuff. If you, if you get one score on day one and you get a totally different score on day 30, unless you've undergone some, ra some radical changes in your life, I should be getting the same score twice. And that's the idea behind reliability. We want to make sure that our tests and our surveys are consistent within themselves. I have a 30 item measure of something. All 30 items should tell the same story and over time. But if I gave you the test twice, you'd get a similar score twice. For example, me, every single time I take a Harry Potter sorting quiz test, it puts me in Ravenclaw, which is a good thing because I think that's where I belong, right? And it's those tests are reliable, right? Because they're giving me the same result again and again and again and again. So we call a test that is consistent within itself, internally consistent. For, and this was the example that I gave where let's say you have a test with multiple items and all of the items are supposed to be measuring something real about you, right? It's almost as if if you take a 15 item test, let's say on extroversion, which is essentially how outgoing you are, how outgoing and talkative and sociable. If you take a 15 item test on extroversion, it's like I'm giving you 15 little mini tests. And if it's reliable, if it's internally consistent, what you say on item one should be similar to what you say on item six and similar to what you say on item 12 and similar to what you say on item 15. Right? If all the items are measuring something real about you and you're not just sort of randomly responding because you don't understand the questions, all the items should tell basically the same story. If you're a highly extra if, if you said hi on one item, you should say hi on them all. That's one kind of reliability, internal consistency. A second kind of reliability um, is called test retest reliability. And that's where we literally gave the same test to the same person twice to make sure that every, everyone we give the test to, when we give it to them twice, gets the same score both times or very similar scores. And internal consistency and test retest reliability are actually numbers you can calculate. We're not going to do that in here, but you do need, do need to understand conceptually what they are. Now, how can we try to ensure that our tests and our surveys and all of our psychological measurements are at bare minimum reliable, consistent? At least when we give the person the test again, they get a similar score. 
whatever we're measuring about them, when I give them the test twice, at least they're getting the same score. Well, the way we do that is by standardizing, standardizing how we give the tests. Um, and standardization is about making some, in research, it's about making something uniform, which means making it the same. How I score the test has to be the same for everybody. How I give everyone the test has to be the same for everybody. Um, the instructions have to be perfectly clear and the same for everybody. I can't have words in my test that are going to cause people to have really emotional reactions that may start that may interfere with their ability to think clearly about my questions, right? All of those things have to be carefully considered when I'm creating my items to ensure that I'm measuring something real and meaningful about a person and they don't just begin to randomly respond or get distracted so that I'm not getting about anything real about them, but I'm getting some random thing they put because of the nature of the test. That's the idea. And reliability is incredibly important. In fact, it's a bare minimum. If you can't even get the same score twice, what are you measuring? You're not measuring anything real about a person. If, let's say I have a measure of uh, extroversion, and on Monday you take this measure of extroversion and it says you're super extroverted. And then you take it again on Friday, and suddenly the test is saying you're an introvert. That test isn't measuring anything real about you at all, right? Because it's not even reliable. It's not even giving you the same score again and again and again like it should, right? And so think of like a bathroom scale. If you had a bathroom scale, and every single time you got on it, it told you a different number, you'd be like, this scale is totally broken. First it said I was 50 pounds, and now it's saying I'm 120 pounds, and now it's telling me I'm 362 pounds. It wouldn't be measuring anything about you. Those numbers would literally not apply to you because they were just seemingly random things that the test was giving you because the test wasn't even giving you consistent responses, right? So reliability is very important. It's a bare minimum. Our tests at least have to give us consistent results about people. And let me give you an example of a test that isn't, that isn't reliable at all. It's a really popular one. It's a really, um, it's a really, and I'm going to go back a slide, so, because we we're not talking about validity yet. We're still talking about reliability. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a test called the Myers-Briggs, and it's a personality test. And if you're on Facebook or Instagram or Reddit or any social media, every once in a while you'll see, like, posts come through your uh, social media feed um, that essentially talk about, oh, what are you? Are you an ENFP? Are you an INFJ? Right? There are these four letters that are supposed to sort of summarize your personality. And what I can tell you is that the Myers-Briggs is not particularly reliable. About half the people who take the test, and this is supposed to be a personality test, right? Personality is not something that radically changes over time, right? If someone is generally sort of um, agreeable and pleasant and quiet, uh, it, you know, when they're 20, you check in with them when they're 22 or 23, and they're probably still more introverted and generally agreeable, right? Personality does not radically change, at least barring some really significant life trauma. It's just not something that changes. And yet, 50%, 5-0, of people who take the Myers-Briggs within a six-month period, we're not even talking about years later, within a six-month period get classified as a different personality, a different personality type. So the Myers-Briggs isn't even reliable. And it's uh, really a shame that uh, a lot of companies actually use it as some sort of guide for like what kind of jobs people should have because it's just not a very good test. It's not even reliable. I know, dirty little secret of the Myers-Briggs. So if reliability is a bare minimum, what else do you need? You need something called validity. And validity is different than reliability. Reliability is measuring anything real about a person. Anything where if you gave them the test and then you gave them the test again, they would get a similar score. But it's, that's not, that doesn't mean you actually measure what you think you're measuring. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example of a, of, of, of a, uh, let's me, let me use that bathroom scale example again. Let's say there's a scale and, and it's not broken, 
right? It's it, it's not broken, but you decide to like monkey with the thing on the bottom. You know, you get on the skin, and you're like, oh, oh gosh, too much, too uh, too too much uh, good stuff over 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 uh over the summer. I, I I've gained a few pounds, and so you like move the thing on the bottom, and so it says that you're 20 pounds less than you are. And every time you get on the scale, you're like, ah, it gives you the same number, right? You get on the scale in the morning, you get on the scale the next day, it gives you generally the same number, right? It's a reliable scale, totally reliable, very consistent. It's measuring something real about you. It is something real about you. But is it measuring your weight accurately? No, it's measuring your weight minus 20 pounds. And this is an example of measurement being reliable, giving you the same result, measuring something real, but not measuring what it's supposed to measure. The scale is supposed to measure your weight. And now, every time you get on it, it's giving, your, giving you your weight minus 20 pounds. So it's a reliable scale, but not valid. Because validity means that when you give that person that number, that is psychological measurement, that number means what you think it does. When you interpret that number as somebody's depression, that interpretation is accurate. When you take somebody's SAT score and you use it as a guide for whether or not you should admit them into a college, that, and, and if you want to argue that that's a permissible use of it, that is the idea behind validity. You're going to interpret that score. Is it a valid interpretation? That is the idea behind validity. Not whether or not you can get the same score over and over again, because that's a bare minimum. This is an additional, much harder thing that you're going to have to establish if you want to do good measurement. You have to say, I've measured something consistently. I get the same score over and over and over again for this person. And that score, my interpretation of it, is the correct one. That is the idea behind validity. So you can see. Reliability and validity in this course have very specific technical definitions that you need to know and be very familiar with. So let's let's talk a little bit more about validity. <clears throat> so reliability is actually something you can calculate. It's a number you can calculate. You just see if everyone is responding the same way both times, right? Uh, if you give the test twice, that's called test retest reliability. You can just compare and contrast the two test scores against each other. It's very straightforward. But validity, validity is about interpretation. It's about interpreting someone's score. And so that's a much tougher nut to crack. You're going to have to gather evidence. It's like a, it's like a validity finding expedition, like your, you know, uh, Indiana Jones for those old enough to remember Indiana Jones, right? It's a, it's like a, it's a validity finding expedition where you actually have to gather evidence that your, your, your scale or survey or test or assessment actually measures what you think it does. And when you interpret that person's score, that that interpretation is the correct one, the valid one. And there's actually lots of different kinds of validity that I could go over. And essentially, those are different pieces of evidence that you could then go look for that would suggest that your interpretation of the person's score is the correct or valid one. And uh, I'm not going to go over all of them, but rather I'm going to give you the four most important, the four most common and most important types of evidence that you can gather to establish that your survey or test or psychological measurement measures uh, that when you measure someone with it and you interpret their score, it's the correct, valid interpretation. And the first one is face validity right here. And face validity is just the idea that the items look good. The items seem to measure the construct that you say you're trying to measure. And so let's use, again, the SAT as an example. Let's use the SAT as our working example of, of a construct that we're hoping to measure. And let's say we've already established that the SAT is reliable. It, all the different subsections of the SAT, if people do well on some of the items, they do well on all of them. If they do poor on one of the subsections, they do poor on all of those items. 
and then people's scores on the SAT don't generally uh, change uh, more than a couple hundred uh, points. People's SAT scores don't generally uh, jump hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of points. Um, it's, it shows a lot of test retest reliability and a lot of internal consistency. Your job is not done because now you want to argue that this test should be used, it should be interpreted is how prepared someone is for college. Do you see how that's a different question? Just establishing that you can get the same result over again does not establish that when you interpret this as somebody's academic preparedness, that that interpretation is a valid one, right? So here are the four types of validity I might gather if I'm, if I'm trying to argue that the SAT should be used as a guide for college admittance because I think it really measures scholastic preparedness, this construct. And face validity is I would just look at the items and go, yep, those seem to measure things relevant to college. They seem to be scholastic in their content. Face validity. You look at the face of the items and just go, yeah, they seem good. But that is not a place to stop, right? You need more. Another type of validity is to essentially do a literature review. Do, to find out all the research that has ever been done on, like, uh, the kind of skills necessary for college, right? Uh, and say, okay, we have created a test that covers every different facet of everything that would be needed to do well in college. That is called content validity, right? And that is why the SAT has multiple sections. It, it has a quantitative section with multiple different subsections in math. It has a verbal section, which has uh, lots of different subsections of, of verbal, uh, in, verbal, um, in verbal ability, in, in addition to like analytical ability. And then it has a writing portion, or at least um, I, I think so. I know the GRE does. I can't remember if the SAT does. Right? It's got all these different subsections. And if you think you have asked questions that cover every single aspect of academic aptitude or academic preparedness, then you can argue that you have content validity. You have asked all the possible types of items that you can. And so that's pretty good, too, if you can do that. But the, probably the most important type of validity that you can gather is what is called criterion-related validity. And this is where you take your test, you take your survey, and you connect it to people's actual behaviors. And you say, people who take this test, their scores actually predict the kind of behaviors that they ought to. And so for the example, of, and that is called criterion-related validity, because what you say is there's some criteria that would make it, that would prove to you that my test works. And that is, and that is the best kind of get, uh, evidence you can gather. And so in the, uh, with the example of the SAT, you can show criterion-related validity if you could show people with high SAT scores t tend to be more likely to graduate college or more likely to do better in college and people who do poorly on the SAT are less likely to graduate college or, uh, or, uh, or more likely to struggle in college, right? That would be one type of uh, criterion-related validity. And even that wouldn't be enough, right? I'm just giving you examples. And there's two different subtypes of criterion-related validity. There's something called concurrent, which means what you do is you say, this test predicts behaviors right now. So, for example, if you could show that the SAT is related to high school GPA, right? That is right now. You take the SAT in high school, GP, high school GPA, and you say, yep, there seems to be a relationship right now concurrently, which means right now. Or you could do what's called predictive criterion related validity, where you could actually look at people's SAT scores and then look into the future and then say, okay, when they graduate college, we'll see what their college GPA is and we'll, uh, we'll see if the SAT did a pretty good job of predicting how well people did in college. That would be an example of predictive criterion related validity. And at the end of the day, you're going to gather as much evidence that, as you can, as much evidence as you can to then argue that you have something called construct validity. And construct validity means you are trying to argue that when you say you're measuring scholastic aptitude, you are actually measuring that. That when you say you're me the SAT measures a person's ability to do well in college, 
if you have construct validity, you're saying you're actually measuring their, their ability to do well in college. It's called construct validity. And that is the idea. And there is no statistic to calculate for validity. It's just an ongoing process. It's going to be an, it, it, it's going to be, and it's really never ending, right? Because you're, you're making a big, bold statement about people. Anytime you get engage in psychological measurement, you are making a big, bold statement about people because you're interpreting their scores as meaning things about themselves, about their psychological abilities or psychological, their feelings, their perceptions, their attitudes, their preferences, their personality, their uh, mental health issues. You're interpreting a, a number for them. And so whenever you make a survey or a test or an assessment, whenever you psychologically measure someone, your, your sort of argument that your interpretations, your tests are valid is really never going to stop. For example, the Beck Depression Inventory is the most common survey for depression in, in, among people who study depression. Um, there are, essentially, if you're a person who's interested in depression and you want to see how depressed someone is, it's not very depressed to very depressed, you're probably going to give them the Beck Depression Inventory. It's around 15 to 20 items. It asks questions like, um, to what extent do you feel worthless on a scale of 1 to 5? To what extent uh, uh, do you feel um, uh, grief on a scale of 1 to 5? Things like that. It asks questions about how depressed you feel. And it is well validated. It is highly reliable. But there are literally thousands of articles establishing the validity of the Beck Depression Inventory. And these are not even articles on depression. I mean, they're not looking at sort of the genetics of depression or uh, trauma and how it relates to depression. They're just thousands of articles going, yes, the depression, Beck Depression Inventory really measures depression. We promise. Thousands of articles establishing its validity um, because validity is a big deal. And if you say somebody is highly aggressive because of some score in a test, you would be pr you had better be pretty darn sure that that test actually measures aggression. That is the idea. Let me give you one more example of the difference between reliability and validity. And I will use this meme from ICanHasCheeseburger.com. Professor Kitte doubts the validity of your exam grade. Now, research and statistics would indicate in every class there is a long-term successful cheater. Not you. I'm sure not you. I'm sure none of my wonderful students. But there are long-term successful cheaters out there. Now, let's say I give someone an exam. And every single time this person takes one of my exams, they do super awesome. And they do super awesome on all the items. Have I measured this person reliably? Yes, I absolutely have. I've measured something real about them. I've measured something that is going to be replicated over and over and over again on every item and every test. What have I measured, though? Have I measured something valid about them? When I interpret their score as their actual understanding of the material, is that a valid interpretation? Nope. But I've measured something real. What have I measured? Their ability to cheat. I have measured their ability to cheat reliably. I don't know it because my interpretation isn't valid. That's the idea. Reliability is just about getting the same score again and again because you're measuring something real about the person. Validity is the idea that you're measuring that one specific thing that you're trying to get at so that you can interpret that person's score accurately. Reliability is about consistency. Get the same score again. Validity is about accuracy. Get the right score for the thing you're trying to measure. And one more metaphor. Um, I like to sort of, let's use a visual metaphor. Let's imagine, uh, let's imagine every single thing that every single item on a test or every single test is trying to measure depression. And every item and every test is going to go boing. It's like an arrow. You're trying to hit the depression target. You're trying to measure depression. And every test and every item on that test is an arrow trying to hit depression. Are you with me? 
All right. Well, reliability is the idea that every time you try to measure depression, you do hit the same place every time. Whatever, the, whatever is going on with this person, you, they're answering the questions the same way every time. You are consistently getting the same score every single time. But validity is hitting the bullseye. Validity is hitting the bullseye. That is the idea. So this would be a test where every single time you try to measure depression, you get a wildly different score. Sometimes this person appears to not be depressed at all. Sometimes this person seems to be so depressed, I don't even know how they get out of bed. This would be a test that is reliable. This in the center would be a test that is reliable, but not valid. You're getting the same score for someone, but maybe this test always overestimates how depressed people feel and it's not accurate or maybe this test doesn't actually measure depression at all maybe this test actually measures anxiety or maybe this test measures somebody's long-term ability to cheat and not their actual understanding of the material you're measuring something just not the thing you think you are and this last one down here that last one down there is going to be validity, a test that is not only reliable, but also valid. So here's a hard question now. Can a measure be reliable, but invalid? Can you get the same score over and over again, but not actually be measuring what you think you are? Be measuring something consistently, but not the accurate thing you're hoping to measure. Well, yeah, right? That was this example in the middle here, right? But can you have a measurement that is valid but not reliable? And the answer is no. If you're hitting a different spot every single time, every single time you try to measure depression, you're getting a wildly different score, could you possibly be measuring depression? No. You can't, uh, reliability is a bare minimum. And then once you've established that one of your surveys or tests or psychological assessments is reliable, then you have the much harder job of showing that it is valid. All right, that's, uh, that's our last topic. Uh, that's, our, that, that's the last thing I have to say about measurements. Um, and thank you so much. And I will look forward to you next time where we will talk about distributions.